Okay, hello. Thank you for those who are here for this uh, lecture at an unusual time. Um, oh, so, okay, so I'm uh, I'm going to say a little bit about what I didn't get to at the end last time, which is madness. I <laughs> um, right. So Locke says. Um, This is book two, uh, chapter 33, section four on page I shall be pardoned for calling it by so harsh a name as madness, when it is considered that opposition to reason deserves that name and is really madness. And there is scarce a man so free from it, but that if he should always, on all occasions, argue or do, as in some occasions he constantly does, would not be thought fitter for bedlam than civil conversation. <clears throat> right, so he's talking about something um, that we all do, he says. it's He calls it the association of ideas. Um, and he says that he's calling it madness. Um, and he expects an objection to using so harsh a name as madness for this. So, I mean, I think, you know, he's expecting an objection from the sane person, basically, right? Like the sane person is, that is the more or less sane person, <laughs> um, is going to say, uh, you know, um, how dare you call me mad just because of this like little kind of mistake I make that everyone makes. Um, we, I think we might imagine the, the objection coming from the mentally ill person, right? Well, they would say, uh, um, you know, I'm suffering from this serious disorder <laughs> and, uh, you know, how, how dare you trivialize it by comparing it to this ordinary type of mistake that everyone makes. Um, Um, and to both of them, Locke is saying, you're like, you're not as different as you think, basically, <laughs> right? That's, that's the nature of the claim in that latter part of the sentence where he says, like, um, almost everyone, you can find a way they constantly argue or constantly act, right? So he's not talking about things that, as, as he emphasizes, he's not talking about like weird exceptions where for some reason, because we're carried away with a passion or whatever, we act in, in a way that's similar to uh, the way uh, someone committed to bedlam would act, right? Bedlam is like a asylum for mentally ill people so um he's saying no it's not just that if you look carefully at each person you'll find certain areas where certain topics or recurring situations or something where they constantly act that way and if they acted that way in every case they would be committed <laughs> um right so he's saying it's not different in kind it's just different in quantity um 
And moreover, he goes on to say that he actually first started thinking about the topic of association of ideas because he was thinking about what are the causes of madness. Um, and then only later did he realize that, well, actually, this has a really general application. So what is this association of ideas? Now, by the way, like, is this a good explanation of what we call mental illness? Or, I mean, I guess some people want to call it madness again now. I, um, anyway, is this a good explanation of that, whatever it is? And the answer is, well, I mean, there's so many different things. It almost for sure isn't an explanation of all of them. And is it an explanation for any of them? I don't know. Um, um, I mean, I don't even know if this whole way of talking about our mind as containing ideas and whatever is accurate, let alone it's used to explain madness. But it is interesting to see what Locke says about it, especially because, and we're going to see the beginnings of this, at the beginning of it, not really. Well, anyway, I'll just say, excess, especially because in later English empiricism, especially as opposed to Scottish, the principle of association was um, the association of ideas was made into the explanation of everything we ever do or think. Right. So the thing that Locke is blaming for madness, um, they said, is like the central principle of all psychology. <laughs> right. That was called the associationist school. And I was going to say we'll see the beginnings of that in Hume, but that's misleading for several reasons. But um, and it's not even exactly right to say it starts with Locke. There's another person who is a contemporary of Locke, uh, Hartley. What was his first name? David or Joseph or one of those names. I don't know. Anyway, Hartley, uh, um, who uh, is not nearly so interesting a philosopher as Locke, but who uh, in a way is more the origin of the association to school than Locke is. Um, but in any case, uh, this this is one of the roots of something that became later very important. Um, all right. So, but it's also it's also interesting because it sheds a lot of light on the way Locke thinks about other things, and in particular, we'll see that it's related to um, what Locke thinks of as a very serious abuse of language in Book Three. So what is this principle of association of ideas? Or what is this phenomenon, I guess I should say, of association of ideas? So in the next section of chapter 33 of book two on page 355, um, some, of our ide some of our ideas have a natural correspondence and connection one with another. It is the office and excellency of our reason to trace these and hold them together in that union and correspondence which is founded in their peculiar beings. Besides this, there is another connection of ideas wholly owing to chance or custom. Ideas that in themselves are not at all of kin. Right. So what he's saying is, you know, um, reasoning means putting ideas, and we'll see more in book four about exactly how this is supposed to work and how it's supposed to lead to what we usually call reasoning. Reasoning or using reason is a matter of putting ideas in the correct natural order. Now, in the case of demonstrative arguments that yield knowledge and Locke's strong sense of knowledge, these connections are going to be those visible necessary connections that we were talking about before. Right? So this might be a geometrical proof. Um, and I'm 
using the fact that the primary qualities have these visible necessary connections one to another to put them in a certain order that yields a conclusion. But uh, in the case of um, arguments about external matters of fact, um, these connections are not going to be so strict, right? So like if I argue, you know, that it's going to rain tomorrow because blah, 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 that, you know, I'm going to put ideas in a certain order that's going to lead me from the, I, you know, it's, the way Locke thinks of it basically is it's gonna like set up a connection between the, the idea of tomorrow and the idea of rain, <laughs> something like that. Uh, but these connections are not gonna be strict they were in the, the way they were in the geometrical proof. These are gonna be connections of like evidence and they yield to probable rational judgments of probability is the, the way Locke understands it. So both of those are the office of reason. Here he's not distinguishing them, but I but I want to distinguish them to make it clear that we're that it, it's not as if everything except geometrical proofs is madness. <laughs> okay, reason has its function in these probable arguments too, and if we follow it, we'll end up with things that were rationally entitled to believe somewhat strongly, but not to be a hundred percent sure of. Right. So, um, so that's the natural order of ideas. And again, it's easier to understand in the demonstrative case. I don't know that Locke ever says that much about what these weaker, like evidential connections are like. But then Locke says there's another order of ideas that's not natural. It's not based on the ideas themselves. It's not based on their intrinsic characteristics. So, so in other words, in these cases, even in the probable case, it's something about the ideas themselves that allows reason to, to connect them. But there's a way that ideas get connected that doesn't have to do with their intrinsic character, but just has to do with the fact that I once had them or many times had them at the, together. Um, this is this is the distinction that Spinoza also makes in basically exactly the same place. I, I don't know. I mean, it's possible that Locke got the idea from Spinoza, but I doubt it's necessary to say that. I think a lot of their predecessors also say similar things. But the point is, um, there's another order. You can call it the order of the imagination, but it's, it's the order of association of ideas coming together again because they've come together in the past. And they, you know, they even though I can't see any reason in the ideas that they had to come together. And in general, there isn't. Right. So, like at this point, I like to tell the story about myself that so apparently. I'm told that when I was an infant, I they gave me cottage cheese to try and I choked on it. Um, and I don't remember this, but cottage cheese is one of the few foods that I really don't like. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> I mean, I'm not a picky eater in general, but I don't really like cottage cheese. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, at least a possible explanation, and this is what Locke is, is if, you know, even if it's not right for this case, it's Locke is claiming, I think, with some plausibility that it's right for some cases. There isn't really any connection between the, I, the taste of cottage cheese and choking. I could have choked on anything. But it happened to be that, you know, I guess because I wasn't very used to eating yet or whatever, that it, I was really struck by the fact that this taste came together with this choking sensation, which was unpleasant. And ever afterwards, when I had that same idea of the taste of cottage cheese, the other idea of unpleasantness 
came along with it. And so I didn't like it. That's association of ideas. Um, and Locke says, um, that's opposition to reason. Right? Like, now I'm going to avoid cottage cheese because I think of it as causing pain, uneasiness, but it doesn't really. <laughs> so it's irrational. Um, and if I did something similar in like in much bigger areas of my life, I would be considered insane. Is Locke's claim. But because it's limited to just that one case and other, you know, I mean, probably not just that one case, but anyway, because it's all to me, it only occurs in limited cases. So most of the time, uh, you know, you're able to rely on me to behave rationally. Rationally enough, at least, that you can carry on a civil conversation. Okay, so Matt says, is he basically saying our stream of consciousness connects thoughts in a semi-logical manner? Well, it's, our, I mean, so he does talk about a stream or actually his word is usually train, a train of ideas in our mind. Um, and it is, I guess you could say that it's the train or stream of ideas in our mind that I mean, both of these orders are orders that ideas occur in my mind. So they're both part of my stream of consciousness, so to speak. Um, the question is, what order am I following? <laughs> um, in this case, I'm following the order that's dictated by the ideas themselves. In this case, I'm following a chance order that has to do with the way these ideas occurred previously in the stream. So I'm just like reproducing without reason, expecting again the same association without reason or something like that. Now, I mean, I think you can see right away how this is going to threaten to expand beyond these cases. Right, because if you go back and ask about those probable judgments that are based on evidence rather than demonstrative judgments, um, it kind of looks like, and this is exactly what Hume is going to say, basically, like this connection is that we've is just that we've often seen this followed by this. Right, so there's an argument that it's going to rain tomorrow because the te the pressure dropped or something. Why do I think that the pressure dropping is an indication that it will rain tomorrow? Just because I've experienced many times. Well, in, in reality, it's more than that, right? Like, actually, I think I can explain why there's a connection. But never mind that. Let's stay just as, you know, uh, just because I've experienced many times that the, the pressure drops one day and it rains the next day. So how different is that from this? Now, I mean, it is different somehow. I, I think there's something Locke is thinking about here, right? I mean, the thing that happened to me with the cottage cheese is not at all like learning from experience. <laughs> or I guess I should say it's like learning from experience, but it's somehow gone wrong. <laughs> Um, but I don't know uh, exactly, I don't know what more to say about it from Locke's point of view. Maybe sometime I'll figure out. All right, that's all I wanted to say about that. If, if there are no more questions, I'm going to go on to the, to the use of language. Okay. And I'm just skipping the stuff about adequacy and inadequacy of ideas. It's actually pretty interesting and important, but I guess I don't have time to talk about it. So on to language, book three.
Um, so the title of chapter 10 of book three, right? This is, I guess it's the title of book three is actually of, of words, right? I need to remember. It's not of language. I think it's of words. But anyway, so book three is about language. And the title of chapter 10 is um, Yeah, actually, it makes more sense if I say this is about words. Because the title of chapter 10 is Of the Abuse of Words. And why am I starting by mentioning the chap title of chapter 10? Well, okay, so the abuse of something is a use of it. You can't abuse words by not using them at all. So the abuse of something is a use of it, but not the proper use, right? That's what abuse is. So that chapter, just the chapter title by itself implies that words have a proper use and an improper use. So that also means that when, as chapter 10 goes on, one of the main criticisms of certain kinds of abuse of words is that Locke says um, that when you abuse words in this way, they're useless. He must mean that um, when you abuse the words this way, they don't have any of their proper use, because of course they have some use. Abusing them means you're using them for something. And in particular in section seven, um, so section seven of book three is about the scholastic emphasis on um, the ability to prevail in dispute. Right, so the scholastics, that is the later Latin medieval philosophers, um, um, put a, a lot of emphasis on the ability to do well in disputes, and they would have formal disputes. Um, interestingly enough, although maybe this is beginning to be a little less true than it was, I'm not sure, but interestingly enough, contemporary philosophy is also kind of like that. Right, like if you're deciding whether to hire someone and they, you know, and they get far enough through the process, then you invite them to come speak. And afterwards, as a, at least in the more uh, polite departments, <laughs> no one breaks in while you're actually speaking. <laughs> but afterwards, there's a question and act answer session. And, um, Sometimes the questions are just asking the person to say more about something or clarify what they meant by something. And you'll hear people say, this is a clarificatory, clarificatory question. What that means is it's not the usual type of question, which is an objection, <laughs> right? So the usual type of, of question is, but wait, isn't what you said wrong because blah, 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 blah. And a big part of the reason why you're doing this before you decide whether to hire the person is you want to know how they can deal with objections. <laughs> so it's very much the same skill that the scholastics were interested in. Anyway, uh, whether it has the, the bad effects, well, whether it had the bad effects even to, in the scholastics that Locke says it did, I'm not sure. Uh, and whether it does now, I'm also not sure. But in any case, so what Locke says about this in the case of the scholastics is that because they emphasize the ability to prevail in disputes, so this is um, book three, chapter 10, section seven on page 440. Um,
Um, that this promoted, this encouraged people to develop the ability to perplex, involve, and subtilize the signification of sounds so as never to want something to say in opposing or defending any question. The victory being adjudged not to him who had the truth on his side, but the last word in the dispute. Um, right, so he's saying this emphasis on the ability to prevail in a dispute meant that people developed a certain kind of skill which involved like making it hard to pin down the meaning of their words so that when someone objected to them they could kind of shift <laughs> and have something to say in response and the hope was that um you know, you wouldn't be the last one left holding the bag, so to speak, right? <laughs> that like you would be able to shift better than your opponent did. And so you would get the last word, like literally, basically, right? <laughs> like like uh, your opponent would be silenced, you know, they wouldn't have anything to say to your last objection or whatever. Um Okay, so that's what he's saying, the emphasis on dispute. That's the skill that he said it promoted. And then he says, this, though a very useless skill, now, what do you mean useless? You just said what it's useful for. It's useful for winning disputes, <laughs> right? So it's not useless. So what does he mean? So let me go to what he says later on in section eight. Whilst it appears in all history that these profound doctors were no wiser, nor more useful than their neighbors, and brought but small advantage to human life or the societies wherein they lived. Unless the coining of new words, where they produce no new things to apply them to, or the perplexing or obscuring the significations of old ones, and so bringing all things into question and dispute, were a thing profitable to the life of man. I mean, Is it obvious that bringing all things into dispute is not profitable to the life of man? I think, you know, that's part of the, the question that Plato is asking about Socrates over and over, and whether they were right to kill him or whatever. But um, I think uh, Locke, is actually, especially in book three, has his own interpretation of what Socrates is up to. So we'll get to that. But um, um, but in any case, it's more the first part of it that 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 I want to concentrate on. The sense in which it's useless is that it's not publicly useful. Right? That is, it advanced the interest of the dispute. Because by winning disputes, they could get, you know, whatever, fame, money, um. Uh, etc. But um, but it wasn't. It didn't promote the interests of the society wherein they lived. Let alone of humanity as a whole. And so it's you know, he says at the end, like, is that worthy of comm of comm commendation and reward? And the answer is, no, it's not. In fact, uh, uh, presumably it should be punished according to the divine law. <laughs> um, 
Um, in other words, uh, Locke is, when you ask, what is the proper use of language? What is the proper use of words? I think the answer is, it's not different than the answer in the case of anything else. The proper use of words is the use that promotes public utility, that contributes to public utility. Um, so the abuse of words, um, like I said, apparently will be punished by the divine law. I mean, we don't know how much, uh, like how bad it is, I guess. But I think Locke thinks it's pretty bad because language is, is the tie that, that holds society together. Um, so you're attacking at the root, so to speak. I think he thinks it ought to be condemned according to the law of virtue also, right? That is these subtle disputants shouldn't be held in high repute. If people knew what was good for them, <laughs> that is, if the law of virtue tracked the divine law the way it really should, <laughs> then they wouldn't consider subtlety in this sense to be a virtue. But in fact, they did, right? So this is a case where the law of virtue was out of step with the divine law, as often happens. Whether he also thinks it should be punished by the civil law is less clear. But I mean, I think Locke probably thinks it shouldn't. But Hobbes, for example, who holds a certain similar opinion and doesn't have the same kind of uh, worries about freedom of speech or whatever that Locke does, you know, is pretty clear that, yeah, the sovereign should punish people who who engage in this kind of uh, um, uh, useless and pernicious wrangling philosophy, <laughs> um, right? It should be outlawed. Um, okay, so, so that is, we know that the proper use of words, this is the abuse, so the proper use of words is going to be their, their social usefulness. Public utility. OK, so what is the social use of words? Right. So we know that winning disputes, according to Locke, is not it. So what is it? Um, and the answer is. Um, um, right. That is. Words are useful because they allow us to communicate ideas. So, I mean, this isn't obvious that this is the only or main social use of language, but this is what Locke thinks. And, and after I explain what it is, I may say something about why he thinks that this is the only social use of language. So, like, the way this is supposed to work is this. Um, um, so there's a speaker and a listener. And the speaker has an idea X in their mind. And they have to emit a certain sound. Well, of course, it's not really this simple. But you can think of it simply this way. Every time I have the idea X, I emit a certain sound. Right? I mean, obviously, that's not right. <laughs> that's not actually how we use language. I'm, I'm only going to admit it at a, at a time when it's somehow important for me to, 
for me and the listener that is it's somehow important for society that the listener know that I have that idea X. Right. So, but, but to begin with, just think of it this way, that every time I have the idea X, I have to emit a certain sound. I call this sound Sigma. So uh, how do I emit a sound? Well, I mean, of course, there's different ways I can emit a sound. Um, some of them are involuntary. Uh, best examples of that are not polite, so I won't go into it. But there's right there's certain ways I can emit a sound that are involuntary. But if I voluntarily emit a sound, how does that happen? Well, I have in my mind the idea of a certain sound. Call that idea S. Right plus somehow whatever the will adds to having that idea that makes me actually um, do the things that will produce the object of that idea. Right, but having the idea is central to it. So that is in order to do something on purpose, at least this is the way Locke thinks about it, whether it's right or not. In order to do something on purpose, I have to have the idea of the thing that I'm going to do, and then something else, right? That in addition to that, that um, that it's the part that constitutes like translating that into action. Um, I mean, that other part is like most of how it works. I don't even know about, right? Like I don't know. I mean, um, uh, unless you're a phonologist, you probably know almost nothing about what your body actually does when you make a certain sound. <laughs> um, and you certainly don't know everything about it. So, uh, but anyway, somehow I have the ability after I have this idea to make the sound, which is the object of this idea. So what I need, if I'm going to have a way of signaling, of letting the listener know that I have the idea X, is first that I have to always, when I have the idea X, then go on to have the idea S. And then, you know, this sound sigma, so, right, this sound is like a physical object or state of a physical object, a quality of the air between me and the listener or something, right? Anyway, um, uh, this, this sound travels from me to the listener. It's my mouth. <laughs> All right. And um, somehow, again, by a process the listener doesn't know much about, if, if anything, that results in the listener having the idea of the sound S. That, sorry, I mean, that is the idea S, which is the idea of this sound, sigma. <laughs> and then we have to, the listener has to take another step in their mind where they go from the idea S to the idea X. Right, so this is how language ought to work, according to Locke. This is the proper use of it. I have an idea. I translate that to another idea, which is the idea of a sound. Or if I'm writing, I mean, Locke mostly talks about speaking, not writing, even though obviously he's communicating with us by writing. <laughs> Sometimes he mentions that. Okay, but anyway, let's say I'm speaking. So that means I associate this idea X with the idea of a certain sound. Based on that, I make that sound. And then there has to be someone else who, when they hear that sound, go back from that to the idea X. And I guess also it's not just the idea X, right? Like, 
if I'm thinking of a certain color and I want you to, so I have the idea of that color and I want you to have the same idea, the best way to do it would just be to arrange for you to see something that's that color. Um, but here, I think I don't just want the listener to have the same idea X that I, I want the listener to attribute the idea to me, <laughs> right? That is, I want the listener to, to, to have this idea and know that it's the idea that I'm having. Um, and so the word is a way of doing that. When they, they, they know this sound came from me. And so they know the idea that they're translating the sound, the idea of the sound into is the idea, if everything worked, that the speaker had. Okay, but what's the relationship between these two ideas, X and S? Well, um, there's no natural connection, Locke says, between these two ideas. Um, So, I mean, there's certainly not a natural connection in the strong sense of one of those visible necessary connections, right? It's not as if there's some necessary, like mathematical relationship between, um, let's say, the um, idea of a snowball and the sound snowball <laughs> that is the idea of the sound snowball depending on what you call the sound i'm i'm calling this thing the sound and it's the idea of the sound right so like if x well this is bad because s could stand for sound or snowball <laughs> maybe it's a uh, xylophone <laughs> right. so x is the idea of xylophone and s is the sound xylophone there's no demonstrative connection between them you can't so to speak the the, the listener isn't going to prove based on the characteristics of the sound xylophone that um uh therefore it follows that a xylophone or something like that right there's no connection like that but there's also no natural connection of cause and effect in the sense that the listener isn't inferring from the fact that I emit this sound and some kind of general natural laws, right? That we've learned from experience that I must have this idea. I mean, sometimes we do do that, right? Like you take the case of blushing, right? So if someone blushes, we infer not with 100% accuracy, but we infer by laws that we take from experience that they're, you know, that they're ashamed or embarrassed or whatever. So, I mean, that's, that's still not a, that's not a demonstrative connection, right? Like it's not necessary that the emotion of embarrassment should be expressed by blushing. But, you know, from, our experience, we've learned that it's a natural law that applies to humans, at least, that they tend to blush when they're embarrassed or ashamed and and not otherwise. Right. So it's a it's a it's a useful nat piece of natural evidence of what idea the person has in their mind. But again, that's not the case with the word with the sound xylophone and the idea of a xylophone. Right. I mean, because if that were the case, then as Locke says, there would only be one language. Right. We would learn from experience what the laws of nature are that connect certain sounds with certain ideas. And then, uh, you know, uh, just as. Um, um, 
I guess you could say maybe we would find that some types of people exhibit the, the idea differently than others. But it, I mean, it wouldn't be a, a social difference. It'd be some kind of natural difference. <laughs> I don't know how to put it better than that. But just, I mean, leave aside that 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 possible complication. Just that, like normally, if, if 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 we think about how this would work, if I learn, you know, if I learned that as a law of nature, that people who have the idea of a xylophone emit the sound xylophone, then uh, that would have to apply to everyone couldn't change the word for xylophone. Right, like the word xylophone couldn't change its meaning as time goes on or whatever, because it's produced by a natural law. So, I mean, clearly that's not how language works. So what is the connection? So you might think, well, the connection is association of ideas. Right, that is, you might think that the speaker and the listener have just gotten in a habit of connecting the idea of this sound with the, with this other idea, the idea of a xylophone. So um, why? Because, you know, when they were little, a lot of times when there was a xylophone around, they also heard the sound xylophone. <laughs> I mean, again, that's ridiculously oversimplified, right? Just as it's over, I'm just, I mean, I'm making this whole phenomenon much simpler than it really is, just so you can see how the pieces are supposed to fit together. So like, just as it's not the case that every time I think of a xylophone, I say xylophone, it's, you know, like it's, you know, when I was little, I probably, you know, when did I most hear the sound xylophone? Probably when I got to, like in an alphabet book and we got to the letter X and they couldn't think of any other word that began with X. <laughs> so there wasn't actually a xylophone there, although there was a picture of a xylophone maybe, right? So, I mean, but anyway, like still you might think, yeah, somehow by they've been trained to make this connection. And I think... Locke thinks that does happen. But he doesn't think it's a good thing. <laughs> right? That is, to the extent that, our con that the connection we make between the thing and the sound is just habitual, a matter of, a, like, what we've been, a connection that we've been trained to make, an association that we have, then that connection is irrational. That is, this is a form of madness. <laughs> um, so it seems like, and I think this is right according to Locke, that the use of language, although it's absolutely necessary, at least for social rational beings, right? We can't live without it. There's something dangerous about it. If you hear the same sound connected with the same thing over and over, after a while, you start to get confused between the word and the thing, right? And that's one of the abuses of language that Locke's Locke talks about. Just as like I, so to speak, became confused between the taste of cottage cheese and the choking sensation that I happened to have at the same time. Um, and that's that that far from being socially useful, that's going to interfere with our ability to think clearly. We're gonna we're we're gonna start thinking, we're gonna start to believe that we're learning something about the thing when actually we're just making the sound, for example. All right. So again, that does happen, but that's not the way it's supposed to work. How is it supposed to work? Well, the connection is supposed to be voluntary. Meaning that is, I mean, the emission of the sound is voluntary, but the connection is supposed to be voluntary. I'm supposed to have decided to connect this idea with this idea. Right? 
And that's why Locke says that to use language properly, we have to consent. This is um, book three, chapter two, section two on page 364. Um, it is. So all right, this is the case of two people speaking this or more people speaking the same language, basically. But when he represents to himself other men's ideas by some of his by some of his own, if he consent to give them the same names that other men do, to still to his own ideas, so ideas to ideas that he has and not to the ideas that he has not. So the second part of it is also important, but it, what I want to focus on in the mo for the moment is the beginning part, that um, if I'm going to speak the same language as you, I have to consent to use the same sound as the name of my idea that you do. It should be done voluntarily. I should accept it. So, I mean, this, uh, um, just as I said, the question of what is the right way to use words turns out to just be a special case of Locke's general ethical theory about what's the right thing to do. Um, this situation of using a language turns out to basically be a special case of Locke's political philosophy, right? That uh, governments take their power from the consent of the governed. Um, so, uh, and therefore the same problem comes up that comes up in Locke's political philosophy in general. Hold on a second, when did I give this consent? <laughs> Right? Like, did, did anyone ask me whether I agreed to use the same sounds as everyone else for my ideas? And as soon as you as soon as you say that, you can tell that it's absurd, right? I mean, because before I spoke a language, no one could ask me anything. <laughs> right? So, like, I mean, obviously, and there, and therefore I couldn't say anything. That is obviously I didn't explicitly give my consent. Right. I didn't say before I spoke my first language, I hereby pledge to use my words for the same ideas that everyone else does, because I would have to already be speaking the language before I could do that. So how is this going to work? And the answer is, again, the same as the answer, the general answer Locke is going to give in his political philosophy. Um, Tis true, common use by a tacit consent appropriates certain sounds to certain ideas in all languages. By in all languages, I think he means in every language, right? That is in each language by tacit consent certain sounds are everyone connects the same sound to the same idea so again he's talking about this same this same kind of like contract that exists between the speaker and the listener here um and he's saying uh if they're doing this properly they must have both consented to it but then since they couldn't have ex ex consented to it explicitly 
there must be a tacit consent that is a silent consent. That's what tacit means. So, um, so the way the listener concludes to the idea X from hearing this sound is by presuming that this speaker has given their their, ta their tacit consent to speak the same language as everyone else around here. And it's, um, um, as with tacit consent to governments, uh, it's, that's probably by and large a good assumption because the, um, um, because the penalty for not giving that tacit consent is being excluded from society, <laughs> right? So, right, that is, it's my free decision, sure enough, but if I decide that I'm not gonna use the same sounds as everyone else, then no one will understand me. Um, so I have a pretty strong incentive to give that, that tacit consent. And therefore, it's reasonable for the listener to assume that I've given it and to use that to infer what idea I must have had in my mind. Okay, so that's the way, that's that's the, the proper use of words according to Locke. And that um, shows how it is that words must signify according to Locke or what it is that they must signify. And um, I guess how and what. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, this is kind of the central thesis of book three. Um, words immediately signify only ideas in the mind of the speaker. Right, so what a word means immediately is an idea in the mind of the speaker. So when I say xylophone, that word signifies that my idea xylophone. <laughs> and how does it signify that? Well, um, that is, in what sense does it stand for that? And the way it stands for that is that there's a certain, so to speak, grammar of ideas. Now, this is confusing because we're talking about language, and the language itself has a grammar, right? What here I'm talking about is a, is is a grammar, like a rule for how ideas follow each other in my mind, and not either a demonstrative or natural rule or a rule that comes about by association, but a voluntary rule. I've established for, for myself, I've resolved to make this transition from X to S. So this becomes like, so to speak, a, like a grammatically allowed sequence. Um, or another way of putting this is that, um, that, Uh, 
X is the syntactic meaning of S. Um, S doesn't represent X somehow. I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by represent. S doesn't refer to X. X isn't the object of S. That's not how S signifies X. S signifies X because S is an allowed um, successor of X in a certain kind of sequence. I mean, I guess you might say the sequence that really makes S signify X is the one in the mind of the listener. Um, which they make because they presume that this is my rule, because they presume I've given my tacit consent. And there and that allows them to make this transition. But I don't think it matters that much which one of these you, you call the, the signifying. <laughs> um, the point is that the relationship between them is a relation between signs, basically. Now, I mean... Um, I, I, um, each of these ideas is a sign of something that's not itself one of the signs, right? So X is a sign of xylophones. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I drew that too far. And S is a sign of the sound sigma. So there's a relationship between the signs, which is a syntactic relation. But then on the other hand, there's a relationship between the signs and other things that are outside the system of signs. And that's the that's what's called the semantic relation. This is like my, this is much later terminology, right? This isn't Locke's terminology, but I'm introducing it here. Um, and I'm introduced and I'm emphasizing it here because we're gonna see how this changes, changes when we get to Barclay. I mean, it changes because basically Barclay thinks, well, it's not quite that simple, but in a sense, Barclay thinks there is no such thing as semantic signification. There is no such thing as reference. There's only this kind of relationship between ideas. All right, like I said, it's not quite that simple, but I'll explain what's not when we get to Barclay, why it's not quite that simple. But for now, I just want to point out, so in Locke, we have two different kinds of signification going on here. The way, the, the way an idea signifies its object is not this kind of syntactic relationship, right? It couldn't be. Like, I couldn't have made this idea signify the object by adopting a rule for myself that whenever there's this object, I'm gonna have this idea, right? I obviously couldn't have done that because the object's not, the xylophone's not in my mind at all, not according to Locke. According to Barclay, the xylophone is in my mind, but never mind that, right? So according to Locke, the xylophone, and most of us, the xylophone's not in my mind at all. The xylophone is an external object. So I can't decide to make a rule according to which this object will always happen when I have this idea or something like that. The idea like itself has to refer out of me to the object somehow. And, you know, like the basis of that apparently, again, has to do, has something to do with the idea of power that comes in with every idea so that 
this is something that I would have talked about if I had gotten to talk about the adequacy of ideas chapter in book two, that, right? That Locke says simple ideas are always adequate. So like the idea white is just the idea of the power to cause me to have the sensation white. Um, and um, there definitely is such a power because I had the sensation. Um, that, you know, to, to make that make sense, again, you have to say that, 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 that somehow every idea comes in with the idea of power also, just as it also comes in with unity and so forth. But okay, never mind that. Somehow or other, this idea can refer out of me to something else. But the words don't signify ideas that way. I mean, the idea of the word signifies the, the actual sound, just as every idea signifies. This is also an external object, like a xylophone. But the word or the idea of the word doesn't signify the idea in this, in this way. It signifies it just in this syntactic way. It represents it in the sense that I can exchange one for the other, so to speak, according to the rules. And, you know, when you look at it this way, you can see why, where this thesis comes from. Because, again, I can't make a rule that um, I'm going to make this sound when someone else has a certain idea. I don't have their their idea in my mind, so I can't make rules about what's going to come after it. <laughs> right? These rules are about the, the ideas that come in my mind. So that's the only thing that the sound can signify. It can't signify an idea in someone else's mind, and it can't signify an external object. So although this sounds weird, Locke is saying that the word xylophone, or the idea of the word xylophone, depending on what you call the word. Anyway, but the word xylophone doesn't mean a xylophone. It means the idea of a xylophone. <laughs> and it doesn't just mean any idea of a xylophone. It means the idea of a xylophone in the mind of the speaker. So when I say xylophone, it means my idea of a xylophone. At least, um, that's all it can really do. But we get into trouble because we try to make it do more than that. Um, Right, so actually going back to the same um, section I was reading before. Um, Isn't this the same section I did before? No, I don't think so. Oh, it was the same section I should have been reading before. Let me read the let me read both parts of it now. 
right? So this is how it starts. Um, it's uh, book three, chapter two, section four on page 365. But although words, as they are used by men, can properly and immediately signify nothing but the ideas that are in the mind of the speaker, yet they in their thoughts give them a secret reference to two other things. And the two other things are that, um, the two other things that I just mentioned, that is, I secretly try to use this sound as a sign either of an idea that someone else has or as a sign of an object, an external object. Um, but that secret reference is an abuse of language. It's an abuse of words, right? And it's in the list of abuses of words, I think, in chapter 10, section 17 on page 444. Um, Fifthly, another abuse of words is the setting them in the place of things which they do or can by no means signify. And then he goes on to discuss um, one of the two issues, that is, that in the case of substances, we try to give our words, uh, um, we try to have our words signify the object outside of us rather than our idea of it. Um, so why is this secret? Um, I think it's secret because um, the whole point of it is to cover up our ignorance. <laughs> right? So, um, and it's, it's it's it basically works this way. In the case of names of substances, I try to make my word a sign of the substance. Um, that is, I try to make my word a sign of what it really is that that gives rise to all these various qualities existing together. Right. Remember, I said before that the the um, concept of any specific kind of substances is a concept of coexistence of qualities, of necessary coexistence of qualities. There's some, there's some reason that these qualities come together. Something about, as Locke will call it in this book, the real essence of that kind of substance. Um, but I don't know what that is. But I try to make my word the sign of that. So that is, I so to speak, try to get the object to take responsibility for making me mean the right thing. That's in the case of substances, names of substances. In the case of names of mixed modes, Locke says, it's the other thing. I usually try to, I use, I'll use my word and hope everyone else knows what that word means and that my word can stand for the idea that they have, even if I don't have it. <laughs> um, so in both cases, I'm trying to get somehow to get someone else to take on the task of, of meaning something by my word. Um, From another point of view, people like, I mean, Hillary Putnam, who was one of my teachers, um, like turned around and used the fact that we do this to try to show that words don't signify, just signify ideas in people's heads. I mean, it depends how you look at it, right? So, 
you know, like they said, when I call when I call the uh, piece of metal on my finger gold, um, I don't know how to tell whether it's gold or pyrite, let's say. But I'm relying on the fact that an expert somehow knows how to tell. And that's enough to have my get my word to refer to the thing. Right. So in other words, there's they're 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 um taking the fact that we actually use language this way and saying, well, since we use it this way, this must be the proper way to use it. And so forth. So whatever we call reference, this has to be enough to establish it. The lock is going from the other the other way around and saying, look, only this is reference. <laughs> and only this is the way a word can signify. And therefore, if I talk about gold um, and say all these things about gold, but don't actually know how to tell whether something is gold or not, then I'm no better than a parrot. <laughs> um, all right. So I won't try to... to uh, um, resolve that, but I'll just make one other point about it, which is that um, basically, so according to Locke, this type of abusive word is a kind of hypocrisy, right? As he defined hypocrisy earlier, um, making a show of good qualities, which one has not, <laughs> that's hypocrisy. And if 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 you think that knowledge is the most useful thing then pretending knowledge that you have not is so to speak the primary form of hypocrisy um and this is why i said that that in the and that i think there's a Locke's interpretation of, so of Plato's Socrates going on here. So if you look uh, a little earlier in chapter 10 of the abuse of words, book three, chapter 10, section three, on page 438. He says, um, Wisdom, glory, grace, etc., are words frequent enough in every man's mouth. But if a great many of those who use them should be asked what they mean by them, they would be at a stand. So I think um, at a stand. is Locke's translation of the Greek word aporia, or maybe I should say of the verb aporein. Um, which is the, um, the verb that um, in Plato is used for um, the state that Socrates reduces his inter interlocutors to. They're um, um, uh, in, unable to provide a further answer. Basically what it means. So, right, so, so, you know, the person who goes around asking what is, what is wisdom, what is glory, what is grace, etc., is Socrates. Um, I mean, you know, when people talk about the theory of forms, they love to talk about the form of horse or whatever, but Socrates didn't go around asking people, what is a horse? <laughs> <laughs> he went around asking people, what is courage? What is virtue? Right. So, um, and they couldn't answer. So, uh, like, um, 
the people I was talking about, like Putnam or whatever, would say, oh, see, you don't have to be able to say what a word means to use it properly. <laughs> but Locke is saying, oh, see, we're not using the word properly because we don't know how to say what it means. <laughs> and there, therefore is agreeing with Socrates. Um, okay, so... Um, right, so um, leaving aside the secret stuff that we claim that we that we try to pretend we're doing, what really happens is that words are signs of ideas in the speaker's mind. They don't signify out anything outside of the speaker's mind. So, um, um, if it turns out, like here's a type of example. Suppose that I learn to use the word gold by experiencing a whole bunch of things that are yellow, heavy, malleable, and soluble in aqua regia. And now suppose somewhere else that where I'm not at first, um, there's some, there's a lot of things that are also yellow, heavy, malleable, and soluble in aqua regia, but in fact, they're not at all the same kind of thing as the things I'm calling gold. If you examine them more carefully, you would see that they have they share those properties, but they differ in other properties. They, because they have a different real internal constitution. They're made of a completely different arrangement of insensibly small parts. Um, this is related to an example that, that Hilary Putnam, who I mentioned before, used called the twin earth example. Um, where there's supposed to be something, there's a planet that's like Earth, and it has a fluid that, um, uh, you know, seems very similar to water. And in fact, it seems so similar to water that it takes advanced chemical techniques to notice the difference. But so that the, like, um, before the 19th century, people on Earth and people at, knew certain things about water and the people on twin earth knew the same things about their fluid, which he calls X, Y, Z. And it was only after they started to develop chemistry that they started to learn things about water and X, Y, Z that show that they were different. Right. And he asks like, is X, Y, Z water? And you're supposed to say, no, of course not. <laughs> but our idea of water, I mean, since we developed the idea of water long before we developed modern chemistry, shouldn't that apply just as much to X, Y, Z as it applies to water? Well, so basically Locke would say yes, right? Like the word can only refer to our idea. So those other things that we don't know about water that depend on its real essence are not relevant to whether something is water or not. So that X, Y, Z is water. Yeah, Zoe, did you, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, this is, I promise, related. But recently <laughs> they found um, giraffes in Africa that they thought were the exact same species of giraffe because they had been categorizing them by like um, the print on their fur. And when they tested them genetically, um, the giraffes that look pretty much identical but live in slightly different parts are so genetically different that they had to categorize them into different um, subspecies. Uh, and there's apparently like 10 plus different subspecies of giraffe that we never knew about. <laughs> and um, so that's like a real life example of the water thing, although I don't know the Latin word for giraffe, but all yeah. these giraffes had been under this one name Camelopardus. and then we tested them <laughs> genetically and there's like 
many different kinds of giraffe that are very genetically different for some reason. So. Yeah. I mean, of course, biological species are somewhat different from these chemical species. There's a, a whole other complication, right? Like the way we now understand what a biological species is, they're not really defined by common characteristics at all, right? They're defined by, by lineage. So, uh, um, so like if there were giraffes on another planet, somehow miraculously they developed exactly like our giraffes, right? So that they're genetically identical to our giraffes. They wouldn't be a mem they wouldn't be members of our species giraffe because there's no common ancestor. <laughs> Um, right. So, I mean, but that's weird and, and that, you know, has to do with evolution and other stuff that Locke doesn't know about. So, um, but yeah, I mean, um, uh, that's an example where Locke would say, if we like, we can now form new words for these different kinds of giraffe that before all fell under our one idea. But the old word obviously only could mean the idea we always associated with it. I mean, so like, I don't think he thinks you're never allowed to change the meaning of a word or something, you know, obviously. So, I mean, among the things we could do is decide that our word for that species of giraffe or whatever has to now be used for something else, you know, like the way we decide to use the word fish not to include whales or, you know, which is something he knows about. Uh, but, um, um, but when we do that, we're changing the meaning of the word is the point according to Locke. And therefore, you know, he describes a child growing up doing what we would usually call learning what the word gold means as changing what it means by gold. <laughs> right? So like at first, all the child knows is that gold is yellow. And so by yellow, by gold, the child means yellow. <laughs> And then later, when it learns that it's also heavy and whatever, now it's using its word to mean something else, a different idea. <laughs> um, right, so that's the way he thinks about it. And like I said, I mean, it's on the, on the basis of almost the same facts, some people recently have reached the, basically the opposite conclusion. So it's an interesting, and not that they don't know anything about Locke either. They, you know, these people, um, uh, I don't know how much they remembered about the details of Locke, but in those days, you had to pass a comprehensive exam in history when you finished grad school, probably, and they probably asked them questions about locks. So they probably knew something about it. Uh, I mean, no, I'm not sure they knew more than that. I knew Ellen Putnam. He read Locke. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, it's not just like he didn't, like, was, I mean, he actually thinks Locke is wrong, is what I'm trying to say in a very complicated way. And not just like independently reaching opposite conclusions. Um, but still, I think, you know, it's not 100% clear which one is right. Um, okay. So that's, um, which time do I have left? Oh, about five minutes. I think, um, All right, I was going to talk about names of substances and the nominal essence versus the real essence. That's really important, but um, maybe I'll find time to talk about it next time. But I don't want to skip talking about um, rhetoric. 
So rhetoric is something that Locke discusses in chapter 10 on the abuse of the words. He doesn't use the term rhetoric here. But um, Okay, so let, let me start with, it's basically, it's section 34, the last section of chapter 10. So let me start by saying that uh, Barclay, in response to this stuff in Locke, is going to say, um, hold on a second, who says that the only or primary use of language is to uh, communicate ideas? Language has lots of other uses. For example, to excite passions. That's Bar Barclay's example. Well, um, of course, Locke knows it has other uses. He just thinks they're not proper uses. <laughs> right. So um, the he doesn't think Locke language has a proper use. It does have another use for recording my own ideas, which he mentions not often, but consistently. But I, I, I don't. I, that's not really socially either useful or 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 pernicious, right? But the social use is to uh, the only proper social use is to communicate ideas. Okay, but now you might step back and say, wait, really? What is the use of language in which it serves as the great instrument um, and common tie of society, as Locke puts it? Isn't it precisely the rhetorical use that Locke is condemning? Right? I mean, you know, uh, how do you get society to stay together? Is it by making mathematical demonstrations? No, it's by giving patriotic speeches and whatever, right? Um, so, uh, Oh, Matt wants to know if you can ask a question after class, if it's short, but I'm kind of tired, so hopefully. <laughs> um, but, uh, and Josephine says, isn't rhetoric mostly about disputes? Um, well, I mean, one of its uses, I guess, is to win disputes. Um, but uh, um, but isn't it also used to settle disputes, basically? <laughs> I think that's what I was just saying. So I think uh, the reason Locke believes that that only the communication of ideas is publicly useful is that um, he thinks that if we could speak and think clearly about it, ethics would be just as demonstrative as mathematics. He's going to say that in book four. Right? I mean, remember, the divine law is the natural law, is the law of reason. The way it's promulgated is through our reason. So, like, the use and excellence in, of our reason and connecting ideas together in the right order is exactly the way we can learn to do what we really should. And therefore is the basis for, is the, the only true basis for holding society together. And so the right use of language is not just to arbitrarily get people to have certain ideas, but to get them to have ideas in the right order, the order prescribed by reason. And that's why he says when he discusses rhetoric, 
that um, um, well, he does use the term rhetoric correctly. But yet, if we would speak of things as they are, we must allow that all the art of rhetoric, besides order and clearness, blah, 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 is bad, right? So order and clearness is the part of rhetoric that, that teaches you how to excite ideas in the correct order. That part's good, and the rest of it is bad. Sorry, this is all on page uh, 452. As I said, the very end of book three, chapter 10. But then there's just one more thing that I know I'm going over, but there's just one more thing I want to read here. So here's the end of the se section where Locke says, people are going to be upset that I'm saying this about rhetoric. And he says, why are they going to be upset? Eloquence like the fair sex, has two prevailing beauties in it to suffer itself ever to be spoken against. And tis in vain to find fault with those arts of deceiving, wherein men find pleasure to be deceived. This is the place I was talking about, where it seems like Locke is taking advantage of the double meaning of the word man. <laughs> right? That is, in the, there's an analogy between two cases. We're saying men like rhetoric and don't want to hear it criticized because they take pleasure to be deceived in certain ways. Just like men don't want to hear women criticized. And men in the first case presumably means human beings in general, right? He's not saying mo men as opposed to women like, like eloquence. But in the second case, assuming he's thinking about in a like heterosexual centric way, right? Which I which is probably a good assumption. <laughs> um Men in the second case means men as opposed to women. And the thing that's weird about this is not, not just that it's an example of playing on that dangerous ambiguity I was talking about, but it seems to be an example of exciting ideas in the wrong order. <laughs> Right? That is, it seems like he's deliberately using the ambiguity of this word to make his point more plausible than it otherwise might be. In the very section where he says that you shouldn't do that. And I don't know exactly what's going on, but I but I feel like um there must be some unless you want to. Either somehow his subconscious is poking through or whatever, <laughs> or something more complicated is going on than it first meets the eye. Okay, that's all I have to say. And I will, so the next section, uh, the next uh, lecture will be a week from today on Thursday. And I'm going to turn off, well, I guess I can keep recording. But People should feel free to leave because the lecture is now over. Yes, Matt, what was your question? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, it's about the uh, question three on the first metaphysics exercise. I just have a question on uh, where I misunderstood the uh, the question just so I can get a better understanding. Okay. Um, yeah. That. So, all right. So, uh, yeah, question, yeah, question three. Uh, I don't. Yeah. And reflection. Yeah. Because um, on, uh, on page 110, uh, he says that objects conveyed into the mind produce the perceptions, and in this case, he's talking about sensation. And then in section four, he goes on to talk about uh, the perception of the operations of our own mind, et cetera, et cetera. And then he calls that reflection. Yeah. So I'm, I was uh, confused on where I misunderstood 
uh, how A wasn't the answer. Okay, so I'm obviously, I'm sorry, I don't remember what the question is, let alone what A is. Or, let me hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, question three. Yeah. According to Locke, wait, let me just go. Um, Okay. According to Locke, what is the relation between the two sources of knowledge that make up experience? That is one sensation and two reflection. Yeah, and I, I uh, chose A on page 110. There's, oh, it basically says what the A is, but I don't know if I misunderstood some sort of detail. I think A is the right answer. Why do you, th but you put A and you got it wrong? Yeah. Um, I can show you on my screen. No, I believe you. I, I no, I, I don't. I, I, I just that's disturbing because I think A is the right answer. So okay. it's gone wrong. Um. Okay, I'll try to figure out what's happening. Okay, but uh, just in terms of for uh, my knowledge, I'm mainly more concerned about what I what I'm learning. So it's it's mostly yeah. Yeah, A is the right answer. Okay. B is wrong, right? Because um, he never says ideas of ideas yeah, at all. Yeah, exactly. C is wrong because he doesn't uh, associate uh, pleasure and pain with the two sensation that's in a different chapter. He doesn't even use the term stimulation. Yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, yeah, this is not his terminology. By sensation, we were. No, and this isn't right either. Yeah, okay. it's definitely A. I, I don't know if you put A and you got and it says you're wrong, then yeah, I put I a. told it wrong. What's the right answer? So I'll have to figure out what's going on. Thank you for calling okay. that. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, Bye, everyone. Well, thank you all. Is the, so the next class is going to be uh, Thursday, right? Yeah. Okay. All okay. right, great. Well, thank you. Bye. See you.